This is a, a little update on the project that I was heavily involved in. The project had, I think, 17 or 75 volunteers working on this project. The, the aim really was to try and identify every West Australian who died as a result of serving on the Western Front. So we'd already done the Gallipoli project and we found that there were 1,023 West Australians who had died as a result of their service. And for the, this project took two years to do the research. Really what they did is get every name from every list from everywhere around the world that had anything to do with Western Australia mentioned in it and then collate it all, get rid of duplicates and then two researchers worked in getting it on the story on every one of these people. So the criteria for identifying a person is that they had to be born, lived in or enlisted from WA. They had to have died as a result of their service on the Western Front uh, by 31st of August 1921 because a lot came back and died uh, as a result of their wounds. And it had to be due to service on the Western Front. And the project, which virtually wound up for um, Armistice Day last year, um, found 5,230 men. Now, what I have been doing is taking any of the aviators and trying to build up a, a little more of a story around them, but the three I'm going to feature today are actually not in that 5,230, for one reason or another. They are not forgotten, however, because the next part of the project is trying to identify anyone who died in another of the theatres of war in World War I. Now, just a, a quick recap. These were the flying service units that they could have been involved in. And as ranks, they could have been pilot, observer, mechanic or armourer, uh, gunner or a photographer. So that's, I call them all aviators for the purpose of my research. Now, these are the ones that I have identified. In fact, one another one's been sent to me this morning. And um, I still have to do a bit of work on him. I did speak about three of them before, and the ones I want to talk about today are Roy Moritzen, uh, Keith Stronach, and George Wicks. Now, if you happen to live in the area where I do, in Jollymont, um, you'll find there's this street sign, a new cor a corner that has always been there, Stubbs Terrace and Hay Street, but there's a new street called Moritzen um, Way. Now, Maritzen Way runs through the area of Jollymont that was all of the old factories and fine china works and so on. And that's who Maritzen Way is named after, is uh, Christian Maritzen. Now, Christian was Danish. He got his engineering degree in Denmark, went to work in South Africa, went to work in uh, Charters Towers in Queensland, went back to Denmark, married a beautiful woman, came out here, and um, they had a number of children. Now, the first one in Victoria, then they came to, went to Queensland and came to WA. Now, Christian Ritson was one of the most influential architects in WA. And apart from having founded that uh, porcelain works, which is why the street is named after him now, his youngest son was Walter Roy Ritson. Now, Roy, Walter was always known as Roy, and he was actually born in York in 1897. And that was when Christian Ritz was actually working on the York Hotel and was the architect that did the York Hotel. So, we're not actually talking about Christian, we are talking about his youngest son, otherwise known as Roy Maritzen. Very distinguished looking fellow. Now, the, the family lived in Ord Street in West Perth, and uh, Roy went to Christian Brothers College. Seemed to have got a lot who went to Christian Brothers College. And uh, he was an outstanding student. Many of these young people were outstanding student, uh, good sportsman, um, notable in rowing, Royal Life Saving Society, and so on. However, he completed his schooling in 1915, and he was determined to learn to fly. He possibly tried for the Australian Flying Corps, tried to get into one of the aviation schools and was obviously, if he tried, was knocked back. The other alternative is to go to England and learn to fly, which is what he did. 
So at 19, he left WA for England and he joined the Artists' Rifle Corps. Now, I'm really interested in this. These were groups of artists and actors and whatever that formed the basis of a, um, a light infantry um, corps. It later morphed into the Special Air Service Regiment in England, so I think this is something I can do to look for, um, further into that. Uh, he then got his commission and went to Oxford University where he duly trained as a pilot. Now, this is one of the aircraft he was learning to fly, the SOP with two-seater scout. And he wrote home, and as happened when young fellows wrote home during the war, their parents somehow put the letters in the paper. So he obviously enjoyed flying that particular aircraft. And other things he said was, um, it's a fairly fast and quick at manoeuvring. If I fly this type abroad, my gun is fixed onto the machine somewhere near me, and being synchronised with the engine of fire straight through the revolving propeller. And obviously this is an aircraft that had a, an observer or gunner in the back and they had a, a rotating platform for the gun. Now, at the time he wrote that home, he had only seven more hours of flying training to do and then he uh, believed he was off to France. However, he didn't end up in France. Where he ended up was at Stowmarie's aerodrome. Now, that aerodrome was one of the ones for the home defence of Britain because it was set up in 1916 to defend uh, the south of England um, and the cities from um, German bombers. Now, this massive bomber here, um, the Goth, had 24 metre wingspan, a crew of three, and of course the Zeppelin's coming across. The first one of these was on May 25th, 1917, um, when they tried to um, bomb London, and London was covered with cloud, and so they went down and dropped everything on Folkestone and killed a lot of people there. And a few weeks later, they actually got to London, and so the Battle of Britain uh, started in World War I. However, it was the fragility of the aircraft at the time that actually caused the problem of uh, loss of some pilots. At Stowmarie's, he flew a SOP with Land Clergé tractor, which is a strange sound, but it was known for that central wing strut or one and a half strutter aircraft. He flew there for a while and he flew quite a few missions and they just flew out looking for planes that might be coming in and flew, flew back. He went out one day on one flight and unbeknown to him, while he was out, they brought in some construction equipment onto the aerodrome. He came back, landed at dusk, and hit one of them. One report says he hit a bulldozer and another, a steamroller rather, and another one said he hit a contractor's van. I'm not sure what it is. He, however, was killed instantly. His observer was um, thrown out and I believe survived. Now, he was classified as killed in action. He was in action. A year later, his father actually commissioned Pietro Pacelli, who's a young um, artist in Perth, to do a life-size portrait of him, but I haven't been able to track where that might be. Uh, you may know about Pacelli. When I researched this young fellow, it, was he killed as a result of service on the Western Front? The Western Front's very ground-based and army-based thing, and I, I argued that, well, you could say it was extended in the air, and he was involved in the, the air war, but the decision was no, he was not on the Western Front, so although he's going to be recognised, he's not in that thousand odd. My next one, I'm going to just divert a little bit here because my next two people are from the Australian Flying Corps. Now, to get into the Australian Flying Corps, you almost inevitably had to live in the Eastern States. Um, they often started here on the, on the aviation courses, but really not till about 1917 were they actually in England doing their training. And there again, they had to have English teach them their uh, theory courses because we weren't confident at doing that. Their flying training tended to be three to five hours, then about 20 hours solo, doing all those sort of activities, and the types of tests are not on the average flying uh, course today. Now, this is where they would have trained. The Australian Flying Corps trained at either Minchin Hampton or at Leiterton, uh, though the most, apart from those who ha happened to actually learn in um, Egypt. 
Minchin Hampton was very much a temporary looking thing, canvas hangers, and it was generally just the single seater aircraft training there. Leighton was the much bigger one, uh, um, long-term <coughs> hangers construction. That's where we had squadrons seven and eight, and they were mostly the training of the two-seaters. So they were training for the fighting roles and the bomber roles and so on. So we have Keith William Stronger. Now Keith was actually born in Melbourne, but he came here at the age of about two or three. He was actually a twin, and his twin brother died aged nine months. Samuel Stronach was with the Public Works Department, Mines Water Supply, so he was a reasonably well-to-do family, and they lived in Newcastle Street in Needleville. Now Keith was really active in Boy Scouts. He studied at Perth Technical School, and through Perth Tech did the engineering um, degree through Adelaide University because they had to do um, the exams for Adelaide University and he qualified as a civil engineer. And he was working as a civil engineer for about three years but at the same time he's in the citizen forces and goes to infantry school, AIF school and he actually gets himself into the School of Aviation at Point Cook. Really quite unusual. He was quite young at the time. He was only 20. So he was dead keen to learn to fly. Uh, they are the officers of the aviation school at Point Cook and not clear, but Keith William Stronach is second from the left. Now, he then gained his commission and he was commissioned with the Australian Flying Corps in August 1916. But for some reason, this was terminated. Now, I don't know why, but it was terminated 5th Military District, which is in Perth. and. He was clearly determined to enlist, but he must have done something wrong. There must have been something wrong because he went to Brisbane, which he had no association with, and he enlisted in the AIF there. But, and this was February in 1917, but within a couple of days, he's got a letter from them and he fronts up down in Point Cook to sign up for the Australian Flying Corps. So the AIF put him, told them to take him on so they took him on, but they took him on as a motorcyclist and made him uh, an air mechanic second class. So I still don't know what he did wrong, but he's not allowed to fly. However, he, gets, he goes away to England, uh, leaving here, I think, in <coughs> August, and he goes to the aerial gunnery school in Unhithe, and from there, he gets suddenly sent to the school of a uh, number two school of uh, military aeronautics in Oxford. So he's managed to talk his way into um, becoming a pilot. Quite an impressive looking young man. I don't know about this silly looking hat that they had to wear, but um, he was interesting. He undertook his flying training 6th of June 1918, and by 7th of July 1918, First solo on an RE-8 and he crashes it with an engine failure and he unfortunately died. Now, he had lots of flying training. I don't know his hours in Australia, but they were the aircraft that he was listed, um, box kites and B-2As in Australia. In the UK, he had a mixture of about 10 hours of each solo, dual and solo on um, B-2s. He had one hour, 45 minutes dual on the RE-8 and then he was told to go fly his first solo. Now, it was Captain Wrigley who was his uh, flying instructor who stated, Stronach took off and when at about a thousand feet, he turned left and flew due east straight towards the aerodrome for about two minutes when his engine failed with a loud bang. The engine sounded to have stopped and I last saw the machine flying on normal glide and disappear behind a clump of trees, after which a slight crash was heard. Now, Stronach had turned off the master switch and the fuel and was attempting a forced landing. He just tried to uh, extend the glide over a hedge and didn't make it. And he was actually killed instantly as well. That was the RE-8. Uh, oh, that was an RE-8. Uh, widely regarded as a very difficult aircraft to fly. So, you know, after only less than two hours dual on it, um, it was a problem. He's actually buried in Lasborough, churchyard, which is quite unusual because there are 23 Australian aviators buried at Leighton, 
and this one was buried uh, a little way away and they're not quite sure why he was not buried but it is still a, a Commonwealth grave. And my last fellow I'm just going to talk about, George Viner Wicks. Now, he was born in Fremantle, hence he qualifies for this project, but he left here at the age of two or three. His brother was born two years after him, and by the time the couple had another child, they were living in Adelaide, and then they were living in Marrickville in Sydney. Now, his father worked for the British Australasian Tobacco Company, again, quite a well-to-do family. Um, he'd been working in Perth, working in Adelaide, and then basically ran the factory in uh, Sydney. Now, George was not a young fellow. He was born in 1990. So he was five years as an apprentice engineer with uh, government railways, and then another five years as an engineer on ships, gradually rising up to number one engineer. In February 1917, he was actually selected for the third aviation training school. He'd actually been dabbling in aircraft a bit, and I believe had built one or two engines. However, he was going on 27, and it stated quite um, specifically that they would have pilots 25 years and under. So I think he may have got pulled the wool over their eyes. That's him, bottom uh, second from the right, and that's at the New South Wales Aviation School. In September of the same year, he applied for commission with the AIF, but this time on his paper, he's actually put his age down by two years. So he's maintaining that he was born in 1892. However, he's accepted as into the Australian Flying Corps as a second lieutenant. He embarked and went overseas. He was posted, first of all, to Minchin Hampton and then to um, Number 7 Training Squadron at Leiterton. He, uh, unfortunately, like the previous one, lasted only about a month. That was his actual aircraft. You can see he spent 28 and a half hours on Avros, nine hours on the Sopwith Scout, that was all solo. And then he only had, he's had on an RE8, 6.75 hours. He's had a lot of hours of dual. And they say he, he did have a lot of hours because he was very erratic on landing. And it took them a long while to, um, be comfortable to send him dual, a uh, solo, but unfortunately what he did is again as he, his flight commander attested that he had instructed George Hooks to take up the RE8 on his first solo on the type. He watched the aircraft take off and went about 50 feet up, he swung very quickly to the left without banking. This developed into a flat spin and the nose of the machine dropped. Uh, the pilot shut the engines off, but the machine um, was uncontrollable. Apparently, he just took off and then put in uh, left rudder and didn't bank the aircraft. So that is a photograph of the actual aircraft and the actual accident. He's, again, not buried at Leighton, even though it happened at Leighton. He's buried near the old, at the old Reading Cemetery. And that's because I said he had a young brother. His young brother was also learning to fly and he was at the number one school of military aeronautics at Reading, he had an uncle living nearby and they took charge of the funeral. And so he was buried in a private cemetery, which is not where others are. We have three young men, none of them identified as being part of our 5,230. For one reason, they were all classified as West Australians, but basically they didn't die on the Western Front or didn't die as a result of their service. However, they were all young men from well-off families, they were all highly intelligent, they were all determined to fly one way or another. They died in flying accidents and they died in England, lest we forget.